biological neurons forms complex neural network structures in our brain. As a human, we have 86 billion of neurons in our brain, and over 50 of them are connected together. So, can we build similar artificial neural networks as the biological ones? Well, the answer is yes, and we will dive into the details, construction, and training of the neural networks in this lecture. So here is the skeleton of a standard neural networks, where the blue cells are our individual neurons. Fundamentally, it consists of three parts. So first part is the input features, where the number of the size of the input layer depends on the input features dimension. For example, if a size of 10 by 10 image as an input, we can flatten it to be a vector of size 100. And second, the hidden parts, which can be one layer or multi-layer. And there might be tens or hundreds of neurons on each of these layers, which was decided during the architecture design or hyperparameter tuning. And third, the output part or the output layer, whose shape depends on the size of the feature output's dimension. For example, for a multi-class classification problem, we have three class, cat, dog, or others. Hence, we have three neurons in the output layer. And that's how the three component and those layers are connected are understacked on each other, which mimic our brain's neural structure. What is more, recall that the neuron and activation functions lecture, each neuron has an activation function to decide how to process the input information, or simply put, the activation function decides whether to fire up this neuron or not. And in the neural network architecture, we make neurons at the same layers to use the same activation function, which means these neurons will have the exactly the same mathematics to decide whether to fire up and process the same inputs information. However, recall that each neuron has some weights parameters and these weights are often initialized randomly before the model training. So neuron at the same layer may have different initialized weights and thus we can view the neuron at the same layer mutual independent to each other. And the standard neural network also called multi-layer perceptron or MLP in common. And in the layers with artificial neurons or the blue cells are usually be referred as the dense layer or linear layer in Python libraries. Well, if you would like to see more details, click through the link and check more at the detail book. So how do we connect the layers together? Let us unveil the mask behind the scene. It might look a little bit intimidating, but the logic is pretty simple. Let's suppose we only have one hidden layer and the three outputs in the last layer. For given input x in Rn dimension, first, we initialize the weights randomly with this weights w1 and w2 matrix and their biases b1 and b2. So the W1 and B1 are the weights and biases for the hidden layer, and the W2 and B2 are the weights and biases for the output layer. Well, we can then calculate the hidden layers by using the weight W1 times with the input features X, and then plus the bias B1. After that, we apply the signal activation function 
to obtain the hidden unit's age vector. Similarly, we can calculate the output layer by using the weight W2 times the weight of previous layer output, which is the hidden unit's H, then plus by its B2. After that, we apply the softmax function to obtain the final output Y. As we can see, the input are flowing from the input layers to the output layers, and we call the process as forward propagation. Well, no worries if you don't fully absorb the math. It won't hurt too much, since the forward propagation has already been implemented in the Gluon Deep Learning Library. So after the forward propagation, we need to decide what to output at the final layer. An output function predicts a result as we want, which means the output after the math function should be as close to our label as possible, rather than like those activation functions, which only decide whether to activate the neuron or not, and how much information to process. So the output function is chosen based on our machine learning problem setting. Here are three most common used output functions. So if it's a binary classification problem, then we can use the sigma function, which can accidentally be an activation function for the hidden layers. Basically, it outputs a probability between 0 and 1. Well, if the problem is a multi-class classification, we may use a softmax function as an output function, which I already alluded in the last slide. And it basically outputs a list of probabilities, and each probability represents for a class. This probability should be summed up to be 1, and we may choose the largest probability represented class in the end. Last but not the least, if we have a regression problem, we may just need a linear function. So after we output the result, how do we measure the error? Well, we can use a variety of math functions to measure the discrepancy between the ground truth labels and our model predictions. Well, for binary classification, we can use the math function called log loss, and for multi-class classification, we can use the cross entropy loss. Last but not least, for the regression problem, we can use the L2 loss, which is also called the mean square error. So here are the math behind the scene. Again, don't worry about the detail of the math functions, since this function has already been implemented in the Gluon Deep Learning Library, and I will show you how to use them in the notebook section. And now we know the arrow that a model makes, so how do we correct the arrow? That brings us to the most fun magic part of deep learning, that is the model training. And to train a model, we need to optimize the cost function. That is, to optimize the arrow of the cost function as much as possible. And the cost function is also referred as the objective function or the loss function during the training. And the parameters we need to train are these Ws, which are also called the weights or the coefficients of the model. To search for the best set of weights to optimize the function, we need to distribute the arrow from the last layer or the output layer back to each hidden layers. We usually refer to this process as the back propagation. And in this way, each layer tracks its weight parameter during the back propagation process. And 
we can recalculate the prediction through the forward propagations from the input layers again. And now, let's take a detailed look of the back propagation. So, for back propagation, a widely used technique is called gradient descent. Again, it is an optimization strategy that's used to train neural networks. As what it is named for, the gradient descent calculates the gradients of each layer's forward functions and optimizes the cost function c by moving the weights towards the direction of the steepest gradient descent iteratively. So, backpropagation optimizes the weights by a large series of weights updates. At each weights updates, we minus delta w from the w old to obtain the w new. Here, the delta w was calculated by the learning rate times with the gradient of c with respect to w old, and then times with the learning rate. So, what does the gradient essentially do? Let's take a look of the following plots. So, here are two grid illustrations of some functions, fx, and the gradient is given by the derivatives of the cost function with respect to the weight vectors. You can think of it as the slope of fx with respect to x in the plot. At the start, the first initialized weights can be located at anywhere on the function. But as we gradually optimizing the weights using each step's gradients, the dots are moving towards the global cost minimum, and that size of weights would be the optimum weights for our models. And now, coming back to our gradient descent formula, we also have this term called learning rate. So, what does learning rate do? Well, learning rate controls the speed of the weight update. So, the final updates, the delta w, depends on the learning rate times with the gradient. This is because the pure gradient itself are usually too big to miss the global minimum. As we can see from the plot, if the delta w is too big, then the optimization point might wander around the global minimum. Well, on the other hand, if the delta w is too small, then the optimization will be too slow. The optimal learning rate varies based on different functions and the networks. We usually start from a learning rate with range 0.01 to 0.1, and we change it based on the model performance. Sometimes we use the learning rate scheduler to gradually decrease the learning rate itself. And if we compare different learning rate on this 2D matrix, we are x axis represents the iterations of learning, and y-axis denotes the model error, or the loss. We can then draw the similar conclusion. As we can see, the yellow line with very high learning rate will never converge. On the other hand, the blue line with very low learning rate is converging slowly. That's all you need for the forward propagation and backward propagation. If you want to see more details, check detail box through this link. I probably have mentioned a lot of terminology through this lecture. Let's have a quick summary of the deep learning jargons. So first, is the term architectures. This means how do we design the neural networks, such as 
how many layers it has, how many neurons, add the hidden layers, etc. And second is the activation function, which is a differentiable nonlinear mapping that decides whether to fire up a neuron or not. We apply this activation function to the hidden layers. And third, the output function is a function we apply to the output layers and predicts y. And next, we define the cost function or loss function, which is a differentiable function that we can apply the gradient descent. Last but not the least, we also need the evaluation matrices, which is often a no differentiable function, such as accuracy, precision, or recall. But they are crucial for us to decide whether the model performance satisfy our business needs. Now we have a fully understanding of how that neural networks works. Let's get down to writing the code of a standard neural networks. We will use the Gluon library which is an open source deep learning library that have most of the commonly used built-in operators, such as the cost functions, the forward propagations, and the backward propagations techniques. So we can then go ahead and call the built-in operators directly without coding from scratch. And now let's open the Jupyter Notebooks MLA CV day one neural networks 